Thank you so much, Robert and Michelle. Um, my name is Patrick Robbins. I'm the communications coordinator uh, for Sane Energy Project. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for coming out this afternoon. So um, we've heard a lot uh, just now about sort of how the uh, fracking boom has affected um, the Northeast and uh, you know Pennsylvania in particular. I think it's also very important to note that uh, as uh, we've seen this out of control uh, drilling, this has also really driven a uh, build out of infrastructure right here in New York State. And um, I'm very happy to say we have a terrific um, you know, lineup of folks who are working um, on that issue and addressing that issue of uh, rampant infrastructure uh, here in New York State. Uh, we have uh, Susie Winkler, um, who's been very active on the uh, Constitution Pipeline and uh, Dominion New Market Project, which you will hear all about in a moment. Susie, come on up. <laughs> Susie, where are you from? Um, I'm from Burlington, New York, which is central New York State. Okay, wonderful. And could you tell us a little bit about uh, the projects that I just mentioned, the Constitution Pipeline and the Dominion New Market Project? Okay, uh, yeah. There are um, three projects that surround me, actually. Two to the south. The first is the Constitution Pipeline, which is a 120-mile-long pipeline. And then following it, just behind, is the NED, the Northeast Direct, which um, is co-located -loc with that pipeline, meaning runs adjacent to it for the most part. And then the third would be uh, the New Market Project, which is Dominion Project, which is about 40 miles to my north. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, if you could just have a seat. And um, we also have uh, folks from out in uh, Long Island, George uh, Povel, if you could come up, and Matt Kearns as well. I love this, it feels really game show style, you know, this is great. Uh, George, could you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in, uh, in Long Beach? Sure. Um, there's been a proposed liquefied natural gas port off of my town. Um, I live in Point Lookout, New York, which is between Jones Beach and Long Beach. And um, they're trying to put a liquefied natural gas port off of our shore. And my uh, group, All Our Energy, uh, Renewable Energy Advocacy Group, uh, has joined together with Sane Energy Project and others to oppose this. And we're having some... Um, very good success in building an opposition to it. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Matt, if you could come up, I know that you've been uh, doing a lot to uh, sort of you know raise awareness of the alternatives that we have, um, particularly in Long Island. If you could just speak a little bit about that. Yes. So um, I like how Robert closed with uh, talking about solutions. So on Long Island, um, fracking isn't really at the front of people's minds. There's no wells or or. Uh, it's just not in their face. So um, a lot of us decided we want to focus on solutions, and Long Island has the uh, opportunity to lead on offshore wind. There's two potential projects, uh, one off the coast of Montauk uh, that we've been uh, promoting, and then one at the same area of this LNG facility. So we have a real opportunity to kind of decide, you know, we, we have a real stake in the game here, and we so we've been working to promote renewables, and uh, it's also good... We've noticed um, it's politicians like to say yes to things. Yes. So uh, renewables gives them the opportunity to, to do that. And uh, so we've had a lot of success and built up a lot of momentum around offshore wind. Great, thank you so much, Matt. So we're gonna have sort of a little discussion here um, with, uh, with these, uh, these folks. And um, I want to uh, first get into a little bit more uh, depth so that we have um, more of an idea of what these different projects are. The um, Constitution Pipeline, Northeast Direct, Port Ambrose. Um, Susie, if you could just sort of tell us a little bit more about the project that you've been, the projects that you've been uh, resisting in your area. So uh, the Constitution is 122 miles long and starts in uh, Brooklyn Township, Pennsylvania, uh, goes up north and east through the Catskills and up to Wright, New York, which is a little south and west of Schenectady. Again, the Ned Pipeline, the Northeast Direct, which is also called the Tennessee Gas Pipeline uh, and run by or owned by Kinder Morgan. Um, is co-located with it in New York State, um, and then moves on through into Massachusetts, where it would be a green project, meaning it would um, be a new right of way if it, if it gets approved. And the third project, New Market Project, which is a Dominion project, it's a 200 mile long pipeline 
50 years old. So the difference is that this one already exists. So it has different kinds of issues. Uh, it starts in south central New York and goes up diagonally through the state up to Utica and then west, I'm sorry, east over to Schenectady. They propose to expand the amount of gas that will move through that pipe. And in order to do that, they propose several updates or upgrades on projects and two major new compressor stations, one in Horseheads, New York, the second in Georgetown, DeReuter, New York, which is called the Shed Station, and then the third major project is an expansion at the Brookman Corner Station in Minden, New York. All three of those come together to, to um, increase the amount of gas that moves through, and in doing that on a 50-year-old pipeline, the problem is that increased gas means that there's more velocity, more pressure on the line, and what that means, along with a 50-year-old pipe, is there's corrosion. We have old welds. We don't know how strong and solid those welds are, so um, that makes risk for explosion. Thank you so much. And you you live not far from from one of these uh, one of these projects, correct? Yeah, uh, actually, yes. I live 40 miles from all of them. <laughs> I'm right smack dab in the middle of them. Um, and could you tell me, I mean, you mentioned uh, explosion risks. What are some of the other, you know, could you just sort of outline why this is, you know, why this is of concern for, for you and for the communities that you're, uh, that you're working with? Uh, emissions. Uh, these guys talked about emissions, um, and that is certainly a problem if you are living adjacent to a compressor station. A compressor station is a, a unit that is going to increase the pressure on the line so that the gas can keep me being pushed towards where they want it to head, so it increases the flow. Um, and so the emissions that come out of those compressor stations are not good. You don't want to live next to them. You don't want them falling on your crops. You don't want them falling on your farm animals, your pets. Uh, the Brookman Corners pr compressor station in particular, the one that's in Minden, New York, with this new market project, has atrocious uh, emissions that come out of it, primarily because of two different kinds of engines that will run the system. They're reciprocating compressor engines, and they're seriously polluting. For that compressor station, uh, when, it, it, when it gets expanded, if it gets expanded, it will give out 22 times the amount of formaldehyde that the mini sink compressor station puts out now. We know that people are getting sick from the mini sink compressor station. It will put out 14 times more VOCs than mini sink. That's volatile. Volatile organic compounds, carcinogens. Um, and the same, the same time, 22 times more than the shed station and 22 times more than the Horsehead Station. So, so I have to I have to ask. I mean, these this sounds terrible. Um, and you know, the question is, why is this being you know being done in the first place? Could you tell us a little bit more about where this gas is going and what's driving these projects? No coincidence. Uh, two of those projects um, hook up with the Iroquois pipeline. The Constitution Pipeline ends at the Wright Compressor Station, which is the Iroquois Pipeline, as does um, the New Market Project intersects Iroquois at the Brookman Corner Station. The Iroquois Pipeline runs from Canada down into our country, bringing gas from Canada it sat south into the United States. But they have just recently announced their plan, even on their uh, website, to for the Sano project. They're calling it the South North project. They are going to change the flow, just as Kim mentioned earlier. And it's going to be traveling from our country, from New York, bringing gas from Pennsylvania up through towards Canada. They're changing the direction, the flow of the gas. It will be going up to Canada and out for export. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, hear a little bit more as well about the Port Ambrose um, project that uh, George gave us a very brief uh, introduction to. George, would you mind uh, saying a little bit more about what this project is? Okay, so Port Ambrose is actually a port that you don't see. It's underwater. It's a, the end of a 17-mile, uh, 19 nautical mile pipeline. And it's two floating buoys that a... Uh, 
Well, I, I think everybody's pretty sure that the next generation of uh, the, the tanker ships that will take these um, will actually be doing all the processes on board of chilling it. And if they're chilling it on board, that probably means that it's going for export. But that's, that's not what the company's saying. The company's saying it's for domestic use. Um, but nobody can tell me where they're going to get gas cheaper to bring it here than our gas is here. So um, there's a little bit of a uh, discrepancy there. Uh, the company swore hand on heart on TV last week that it's for import. Um, I, nobody can show me the, the economics of how they can do that. So it's, it's about exporting our gas that we have here, and it's about um, getting the gas from the shale fields out. Um, and all of this will actually increase our costs uh, in direct conflict of what they're saying that this project should go through because it's going to decrease our costs. It will not. So that's what's going on with that. Great, thank you. And um, it does sound like there's uh, a real sort of parallel between these uh, between these projects, right? I mean, in one case, you have uh, the gas, you know, coming out of Pennsylvania and being exported uh, by land, and in the other case, you have gas being exported uh, by sea. So it does seem that these are all sort of one, you know, different parts of the uh, of the same picture. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more, and Matt, you know, maybe you could speak to this um, about what some of the risks are about having uh, liquefied natural gas ports like Port Ambrose in a busy harbor like the New York Harbor. You want, George, if you want to answer this question. Um, okay, well, I mean, there's been a lot of concern. Listen, my, my town is probably the closest to this thing, and the um, and city of Long Beach is also uh, right there. Uh, so I was talking to some of our first responders to see if they would come out and speak. And they're, they're kind of, they're not really, uh, they don't feel it's their place. But they do tell me that this is not something, if, if there is some kind of disaster, um, it's not a matter of, you know, first off, they're volunteer firefighters. We don't have a paid fire force. We have, we have 30 or 40 guys in their 40s and 50s that go out and take care of the community, you know, and, and luckily we have some kids coming in, but that's who's gonna be on the front line of any kind of disaster. Um, so it's, it's an unfunded mandate for my community to take all the risk of this project on, as a front line. Um, and um, I've seen some, some terribly, some I think terrible comments that, uh, that Maritime Administration, who's in charge of, of doing this, um, has, put some innuendo out there that they do have a, a plan in case there's a problem, but it's secret. So, um, because there is a terrorism threat, right? Everybody, everybody knows about the USS Cole. Okay, the USS Cole was, was blown up in Yemen by a couple of guys in a boat trying to attack a US target. It's been pointed out very easily that, you know, that any one of these LNG tankers could be attacked in place or could be hijacked? Could, could it be driven into New York Harbor? I mean, the potential is there that something like that could happen. So I think from a frontline community perspective, I want answers how they're gonna take care of that. Don't, don't tell me, oh, it's, it's secret, um, please. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. And one thing that I would add um, about the uh, Port Ambrose security risk is that we do know, um, for instance, that uh, liquefied natural gas tankers of the kind that would be coming in and out of the New York Harbor um, are very much on the radar of um, groups like Al Qaeda and other groups that are uh, seeking to damage infrastructure. There was, in fact, another attack in Yemen um, or planned attack in Yemen in 2013 um, against this exact same uh, kind of tanker because of of the um, ease with which it can be attacked and the uh, results you know, that would be uh, devastating from such an attack. I just wanted to add that we know that this is actually you know, very much um, on their radar as well. Um, I have a question for uh, Robert or Michelle. Um, this sort of trend that we're talking about whereby uh, you know, gas is being drilled here in the United States but um, being exported overseas um, you know, where there's much, much higher prices for, uh, for that gas. Could you, could you talk a little bit about how you see that impacting um, the health issues that you've discussed, you know, this proliferation of drilling, um, how this you know, will impact uh, you know, other areas or make you know, further fracking more economically viable? 
Well, what we've seen uh, over the last few years is the price of uh, methane or natural gas has dropped dramatically. It was around twelve dollars. It's now it's about four less than four dollars. It's dropped by you know more than a factor of three. Um, and and the reason that that's true is at least partially due to oversupply. I mean, they're they're producing more than can be used. Um, so the one solution to that is to start shipping it overseas. And once we do that, then the, then the price will go up. Once the price goes up, then more areas become economically feasible. There are areas in Pennsylvania that were drilled when uh, gas was at $12. Uh, they're not really that feasible anymore. And so what we're going to do is expand the footprint of drilling when we start exporting. Um, at the same time, <laughs> all these same companies are trying to uh, frack other countries as well. So uh, at least uh, some of those markets will soon have their own gas and their own uh, environmental problems. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. Um, you guys have, uh, you know, put together this really incredible, um, you know, testament to the impacts on, on farming and agriculture that this industry has. I wonder if, um, you know, there are other ways in which this, uh, this industry, the fracking industry, is impacting, um, you know, other forms of agriculture like, uh, you know, fishing um, in, the, in the area that Port Ambrose is being proposed. Um, could you speak, uh, either one of you, Matt or, uh, or George, um, to the reaction from the, from the fishing community um, on, these, on these projects? Yeah, I think the, the Port Ambrose at the hearing, uh, the fishermen were, um, Sport fishermen, in particular, were very um, spoke out against it pretty pretty strongly, and the the um, the terrorism threat is a serious one, but the, the environmental threat is most certainly a, a serious one. This area is starting to come back; um, the whales are starting to come back into this area, and uh, it's a heavily trafficked area to begin with, uh, and th there's very limited space. Uh, so to bring this in um, would really um, kind of upset the apple cart, so to speak. And, and um, the, the, it's mostly sports fishermen and recreation that, that's kind of happening there. That would be, I think, uh, upset uh, for the most. And the, like, these communities, like George was saying, are just coming back to from Sandy. So this is, we are two plus years out and people are, just getting back into their homes or just starting to rebuild. So to, to put this type of project in their backyard and have them take all the risk is just, it, it's, it's unbelievable. And um, it's really uh, kind of scary when you, you can start to connect all the dots and, and look at the economics of really see what, what's happening and what's going on. Uh, so everyone that participates or lives in the water there or recreates around the water has, is, something to lose by this project. No one really, the only people who are gaining from this are offshore bank accounts. And um, it's really something that once kind of the word gets out, people will start to uh, stand up against. And we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of bipartisan uh, support against th this project. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, Susie, I wonder if you could uh, speak to this as well. You know, we're hearing about how uh, fracking is, in, is impacting communities that depend on agriculture um, in the drilling stage and also in the, in the exporting stage. But I wonder if you could speak to how the, you know, what the reaction has been uh, amongst agricultural uh, you know, workers um, in the projects that you've been working on as well and how this is predicted to impact agriculture in those areas. Dramatically, um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, with the Constitution Pipeline, say, or the NED project, those are, again, those, um, at least coming through New York, um, the NED is co-located with the Constitution again. So the Constitution is going to be a new right of way. That means that it will, proposed, as proposed now, which, and it has received its FICE, its final environmental impact statement, so FERC has approved it with its rubber stamp, as they always do. Uh, that proposed project will go across 277 water bodies. That's streams, trout streams, trout spawning streams, ponds, uh, rivers, and I think 14 acres of wetland, 
uh, over a thousand acres of forest, uh, and a portion of that, of course, is farmland. Uh, and so you can imagine how does a farmer uh, deal with a pipeline when it's coming through their property? It separates their land. It makes it so that a portions of their property can't be used. They have restrictions on how they can pass over it, over over the pipeline. That's one aspect. Uh, and then say, take the other project, the Dominion that I'm talking about with that Brookman Corner station. Um, that station is surrounded by about a good portion of the property are organic certified dairy farms. And simultaneously a portion of those are, and then other farmland is, it's a very large Amish population. And when you think about the Amish, um, it's really horrifying. They really are sustained by their property. They uh, farm for their agriculture. They drink the milk from their cows. They eat the meat from their cattle. Everything. Their water, which will you know, water their agriculture, is going to be receiving emissions that are going to fall onto those streams. Um, you were mentioning oils and et cetera that come out of the emissions. So, you know, you can't get away from that. And those will be finding their way into our food shed. So it's scary. Thank you so much. The other night when we were, uh, we were on the phone talking about an article about, the, um, about some of these projects that will uh, be coming out in the next issue of The Independent, so keep an eye out. Um, we, were, uh, we were on the phone talking about this project, and you were saying um, that there had been members of the Amish community showing up at the, at the hearings um, as well and, you know, making their presence, you know, and their feelings on this, on this known, um, which from what you were telling me is, is not common and is not groundbreaking. groundbreaking. Right. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, if you could speak, and this is sort of an open question, anyone who wants to, to answer this, um, why are these projects located in these communities, in communities where there is, you know, uh, folks who are dependent on, you know, on agricultural production or who are recovering from uh, from Hurricane Sandy and, you know, have other things. If anyone could speak to that. Um, you want to go? Well, the best way, I mean, this is, this is, the, this is the traditional method, is uh, to send landsmen into areas that are already depressed and uh, offer them a lot of money. And, and it's, it, it's really, it's, it, this, this is a huge issue. And uh, we're, we're talking about people who are desperate already. Uh, and that's why it's really hard to, you know, we look, at, we look around at all the people that we've, we've talked to and in Pennsylvania, in fact, all over the country, all over the world, who have, who have leased their land and regretted it later. But the reason they lease their land is that they really don't, feel that they have any other option. They have to pay their taxes, they have to go on. Um, so by targeting people in depressed areas, they're able to lease land fairly easily. So it's really, it's really a huge issue of uh, environmental justice. And um, so th they're getting some money, but they're also asked to pay the price. Thank you so much. You know that reminds me of um, you know what uh, what Governor Cuomo was saying during the announcement that uh, the New York uh, Department of Environmental Correction would in fact prohibit uh, fracking drilling here in uh, here in New York State. Um, how many people saw that uh, that announcement when when it was made? Um, great. So um, so some of you may remember uh, you know Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, However else you may feel about him, he, uh, he did say something that I thought was, was really striking when he was uh, talking about the political climate, um, you know, in which this was, this was happening. He said, you know, you travel around New York State, you don't meet really anyone who's like thrilled to have drilling in New York State. You know, even the people who are, who are for it um, are for it because they feel that they do not have any other, any other options. And I think the point you make is absolutely correct, that this is an environmental justice issue, whereby those who are, you know, 
least able to fight back and are you know least responsible for you know for any of these harmful impacts are being burdened with those impacts and that's a pattern that we're seeing again and again and again um, which makes the resistance that we're seeing that much more incredible right you know you are seeing communities um, you know rally against these projects um, Susie if you wanted to just speak to what the you know what the impacted community is doing um, in both the case of the new market project and the constitution pipeline Love to talk about it. Um, so yeah, the Constitution Pipeline. Um, as I said, we've got we've received the FICE, the Final Impact Environmental Impact Statement, which was miserable news. And um, where we're at now is we're in a comment writing time. Um, our deadline is February twenty sixth for final comments and in your goodie bags. I've given you something that will direct you to the website for Stop the, Con Stop the Pipeline, um, which has an amazing setup for how you can make your own comments. Um, there, there are some form comments there, but we're asking you to use those as a starting point for your own. It's really lovely the way they've set it up with an incredible amount of uh, information that will allow you to look at a letter and then read a little bit and then talk about your own perspective on it. But that is what we're fighting now for is a 401 water quality certificate. Uh, New York State has really great water environmental laws and we are asking the DEC to deny the water quality certificate to Cabot Williams, the name of the pipeline company, so that we can stop this pipeline. And we believe we have a shot at it if all of you write letters. <laughs> we just finished um, uh, three hearings last week, and um, they were amazing. You know. Great, thank you. Uh, I know that you mentioned the um, the ongoing uh, arrests and the ongoing awareness campaign at Seneca Lake. Um, you know, I wonder if there's a way that folks here uh, can get involved, or anything you'd recommend in terms of that campaign. I think the thing that they that that group really needs right now that so we are uh, Seneca Lake uh, because he mentioned they stopped allowing people to go to jail uh, for their time. They're fining them, but they're increasing the fines incredibly from one hundred dollars we hear to to much much more. So they're they're really trying to squelch this movement. They're tired of these protesters. They don't want to see them anymore. They wish they would just go away, but they are not going away. They are just. They are just getting stronger. So I think, the, I think the thing that that group needs the most right now is to build up some funds for these people who are willing to get arrested because they're going to get fined heavily. These are people who are common folk. They're teachers, people in the community just standing up out there. So if people want to help that, that protest at all, just we are Seneca Lake. There's a way to contribute. Anything you can would be very helpful. Thank you very much. And uh, I wonder if uh, either of you could sort of describe um, the uh, momentum that we're seeing in Long Island around this project and, uh, and sort of what you know, folks here in New York City can do. So yeah, we, uh, we were very lucky this past week. We've been doing a lot of outreach events um, and we have uh, had very good fortune with the politicians that we have spoken to have, um, have joined us. Um, and then this past week, um, I'm very proud to say that uh, uh, on Thursday, our uh, brand new U.S. Congresswoman Kathleen Rice made her first appearance and said that she was proud to be doing it in opposition to Port Ambrose LNG facility. And I thank her very much for that. And the, the, the Long Beach City Council has been unanimous, unanimously opposed to the project since the beginning of December. Um, they've written letters to the governor. Um, there was a report in the Long Beach Herald that uh, we're trying to confirm that uh, State Senator Dean Skelos has now written a letter to Governor Cuomo asking him to veto Port Ambrose, which is huge. He's the, uh, if you don't know, he's the um, Senate Majority Leader Republican. Um, so we're trying to confirm that, but that uh, was printed in the, the Herald uh, this weekend. So, um, and we did reach out to him and, you know, you don't know, maybe we're making the right uh, contacts in the right case. I, I think people, the politicians are realizing that, um, that pretty much nothing good is gonna come of it for our towns. So um, 
you know, I think we're making a great case. Great, thank you so much, George. Um, one uh, one note that I just wanted to, and just to be clear, Governor Cuomo does have the power to veto that project. Um, there's a period coming up uh, during which either um, Governor uh, Chris Christie of New Jersey um, can veto the project or um, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York um, because of where the project is cited in waters um, that are sort of, you know, where, where their jurisdictions overlap. I think that's something that, uh, Robert, I believe it was you said, you know, the importance of building alternatives. Um, I think that that's really, really important. And it's important for people to know that they do have that choice and that we have this sort of moment of choice right now. Uh, Matt, you mentioned some of the work that you've been doing spreading the word um, about wind power uh, in Long Island. Could you talk a little bit about um, what that looks like, some of the offshore wind projects that are, you know, that have been proposed and what they, what they could potentially do for New York City in particular and for Long Island as well? Yeah, so most recently um, there was a project considered off of Montauk and there, there's one uh, in the same waters as the Port Ambrose one. The, the Montauk project um, did not get approved by our utility. Actually, the same day fracking was banned, they, they passed on the, the offshore wind project. Um, but uh, this is the, the, the Port Ambrose project. And uh, there was some thinking that the two projects uh, and the wind could be in the same area, that the two could coexist. And um, that, that's, that's really not the case because this, the Port Ambrose project would push the offshore wind project further off the coast and make it uh, economically not viable. So therefore, it, um, it could be there, but no one's going to, uh, the electricity would be too expensive to purchase. So basically, it would bump, uh, the Port Ambrose project would bump an offshore wind project um, kind of out, out of the picture, so to speak. Uh, the, the wind um, gives us a great opportunity for true energy independence, local jobs. Uh, the deep water project that was proposed off of um, Montauk, the group um, Deep Water agreed to use uh, Long Island labor and we're gonna use um, our ports and facilities to, um, to start the project. And we're not seeing that on the other side. The LNG kind of just comes in and they have these hearings that hopefully nobody can get to and nobody can, you know, they don't really um, give you a lot of time to, to participate. And on offshore wind, we're seeing just the opposite. They, in, um, they agreed in the Montauk project to only do construction in certain times of the year. So um, the whales could kind of pass, the whales migrate along our coast and they agreed to uh, not do uh, certain construction um, to allow the kind of the whales to do their thing and not disrupt that. Um, but it means jobs and like 200 megawatts of energy that the Montauk uh, project and um, Wind also comes on the grid first, so it, it bumps gas. We heard a lot at the LNG hearings about this polar vortex and the importance of gas, needing more gas, more gas. In 2010, NYSERDA did some measurables in this area about offshore wind, and they found that the winds peak in the late afternoon, early evening, right around the same time as um, our usage peaks. So it could meet about on a good day, depending on turbines, about 44% of the capacity in the area, uh, which is legitimate power. This is, um, and as people start to have these conversations and look at wind more seriously, we're seeing that it, it's, it's everything that the, the gas company says they are. It is real jobs, it is a transition fuel, it is energy independence, it is all these things. The, the other team kind of tries to mask their project like that, but, but it's not that at all. Their project is to make a quick buck and ship all the money offshore and then you know, we'll, we'll clean it up later, or will us, will clean it up later, you know, when it goes wrong. And the offshore wind provides um, a real, a true alternative. Um, and it's exciting. We've built up over the last year, George has done a lot of work on this, a lot of bipartisan support. Uh, for, um, Republicans, uh, Democrats, all, and um, it's, it's a really an exciting, exciting opportunity. Uh, there's also a lot of solar projects happening on the, the, 
the in Suffolk County and and we're having hearings now. It's some people think there's a there's an obstacle because there's uh, 10 to 12 new solar projects that are being proposed, large scale solar projects. And um, people are kind of uh, up in arms because they don't know what that looks like. They're gonna say, well, where are we gonna put in? Some of, one of them is on a sod farm and one of them is in um, some unused land. And we're, we're, the towns are developing uh, regulations and permitting for these projects. And this is what we should be doing. This, these are the discussions we should be having. We should be filling rooms and hotel lobbies, having discussions about how we can smartly really do a transition away from fossil fuels and look at solar and wind in these ways, in these detailed ways. Instead, we're driving far and taking trains to, <laughs> you know, hard to reach places or buggies, I guess, in some cases for, for some of our <laughs> Amish friends to, to um, you know, look at these pipeline projects. It, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, the one satisfying thing for me is to see kind of people coming out of their way to stand up in resistance uh, to these projects. But, um, and on the same way, people seem to be going out of their way to support renewables. They really want to see uh, these things. And um, it, it's exciting, especially on Long Island. We've seen a lot, a lot of uh, you know, momentum in just a, a year. Um, last year, two years ago, offshore wind was kind of laughed about. Now we have uh, state senators, state assemblymen coming out, holding press conferences for this stuff. So we're, we're making a lot of progress pretty quickly. Great. Thank you so much. And thank everyone so much. I want to thank uh, Robert and Michelle for coming down. Um, Susie, George, Matt, 